Okay. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, we're sitting here with Don Bukowski, uh, Ohio University, and uh, this is a learning together session for the last day of August, uh, 2014. So I always mention these these little details because I really hate to listen to podcasts where people don't say when they were made. Uh, I mean, I don't hate to listen to them. I just wish they would give the date. <laughs> so anyway, we're in 2014. We're talking to Don Bukowski, and we're kind of in a pre-session. We're waiting for people to arrive. Looks like uh, Robert Walkman has just joined us. Robert, do you have a microphone? Yeah, this is a good time to test it if you do. Jim went off to get a microphone. Let's see. Let me check the number of mics I've enabled. Uh, okay, maximum simultaneous talkers. It looks like I was the cause of the uh, the problem before. <laughs> I've put in a couple of extra mics. Uh, Elizabeth Ann has joined us from uh, Grenoble, and uh, she's uh, I don't know if you know her from Ayatefel. Um, anybody has a mic? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. But Sounds okay, like it's just working. Rock. Yeah, it is. Thanks, there, Vance. Okay. Uh, I'm all ears, though, instead of talking. No, okay. Well, no, that's okay. I mean, we like to get voices and learning together. We're we're a little bit unique in that we encourage people with anything to share to join us, and we record that, and we get a lot of people that way. But not necessarily. We're we're sort of honored this week to have Don Bukowski join us. She's been doing interesting work with Tracy Talk and uh, other things. Sorry, Tracy Talk. That's a program I made some time ago. Tracy Effects. That's the program, a game program, which uh, fits into the scheme of gamification, which she'll tell us about. And uh, so we like to get people's voices. We like to not just have presentations. Don hasn't really planned it that way. She's got a slide presentation for us, but she's going. She's hoping to get through it quickly and then have a discussion and encourage uh, talking with, uh, not just at us. So she's okay with that. Um, are any other microphones activated? At the moment we've got Robert Walkman from the Philippines and Anne Grenoble from France. Does anybody want to Test the microphone before we begin. I guess silence implies maybe not. Okay. Um, we we have activated four microphones here. Um, I was uh, the cause of the echo problems earlier, so I've sorted that because I've logged in at two computers. I'm the session moderator and also myself. So Don, um, what were we talking about when we said we were going to chat a little bit? Oh, I think we were talking about the difficulty sometimes with taking more innovative uh, technology, uses of technology that are more innovative and then trying to put them within a standardized framework or curricular framework. You know, so we were talking about the Minecraft class that Jeff Kuhn does with us. And um, so that's a freshman composition course at Ohio University. And um, you know, it's exciting and it's very motivating for students, but it's also very challenging for him as an instructor to fit fit that within very serious academic writing. So it's an interesting balance, you know, that not you know, that takes quite yeah. a bit of preparation and, and careful thought and planning. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I was listening to, I was I've been reading are are you familiar with uh, Joe Levin, who calls himself Minecraft teacher? Mm -hmm. um, are you familiar with him? Yeah, just, I mean, not a whole uh -huh. lot, but a little bit, yeah. Yeah, the stuff he does is really amazing. I mean, the, the amount of skill a teacher needs, you know, to set up an environment for students. I mean, he, you know, he builds pyramids, uh, creates secret passages, hides some mummies in them, <laughs> and then has his students go and uh, find them, you know, and uh, all in the pursuit of learning whatever it is in the curriculum that he's trying to get them to understand. And we were talking about Jeff Kuhn. He's, um, the, what he talked about at the uh, at that webinar on uh, gaming and gamification was 
uh, having a, an academic writing class uh, who in the curriculum apparently there's something about disasters and they had to learn a little bit about disasters and how to manage them and then uh, postulate a disaster, a local disaster in, there in Athens. And um, he was using Minecraft in zombie mode to get his students to experience the stress of disaster management. Yeah, that's right. And um, the curriculum actually doesn't include that you have to have disasters or something like that, but it has to have a theme to the course. And so the theme that he's chosen is the apocalyptic American culture right now. So of course we have many movies and books and things like that that fit into apocalypse and it's the time of year when we pay attention to zombies uh, for Halloween here in the U.S. So that's a good cultural component as well. Um, so that it, but it still takes uh, um, quite a bit of planning to get all the curricular goals in there in terms of academic reading and academic writing and have the time for the students to feel um, submerged in that situated context that Minecraft provides. So yeah, he's, he's done a very good job with it, but it's something that takes quite a bit of planning. Yeah, I see Claire has joined Hi, us. Hi, Claire. Franciscan. Yeah. I don't know if Claire has a microphone. Uh, where, I don't know where Claire is. If she's there in uh, Pittsburgh, she in that in the, that area, uh, she might not want to wake somebody up on a Sunday morning. Well, it's not that early Sunday morning, though. This is a little bit late. It's 11 in Ohio right now, 11 a.m. Uh, OK, well, if anybody wants to make any comments, just feel free to grab one of the four available microphones. If you do grab one, please switch it off uh, when you're through using it so that other people can take it. And also uh, be careful of keyboard noises and things like that. So it's really important that you turn the mic off and then if you need it back, you can just grab it and interject as you like. I'm going to switch my video off. Peggy George has joined us from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I don't know if you, do you know Peggy, Don? She's big in the K-12. Um, the K-12 sphere. Uh, K-12 online conference is coming up, for example. She's very active at Classroom 2.0. Those ring bells? Yeah, those definitely ring a bell. Mm -hmm. yep. OK. I'm going to switch my video off. And Don will hand it over to you for a while. Don's going to talk a little bit, just to introduce us to her slides. Like I said, if you need to ask her a question, just grab a microphone raise a hand, and I'm sure she'll pause and let you speak. OK, over to Dawn. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, I thought I would just go through some of these ideas about language learning and gaming and talk about some examples on ways um, that I've approached a couple different things, preparing teachers for language um, learning through games and then also preparing, actually doing it with students as well. So there's a lot of possibility, of course, within all these different areas. There's a lot that could be said. It's always a great opportunity. I'm always looking for ideas to apply some of these concepts to different situations in my situation. I'll give you just a very brief introduction about myself, which can help provide some feedback um, to context to what I'll be talking about. I'm at Ohio University. Um, my main job is the director of our English Language Improvement Program in our Linguistics Program Department. And that's a program we have both Americans and domestic st uh, and international students, graduate and undergraduate students as well. And the um, classes are communication based for academic literacies for specific purposes. So writing, speaking, many different reading and things like that. A very high uh, student since we have many domestic as well as international students in our classes. And so the types of things I'll be talking about are ways that we have been trying at Ohio University in the program to use gaming in our language learning and uh, through, like I said, teacher training as well as through actual student experiences. And Vance and I were talking uh, when we were just getting started about how complicated it can be to take these innovative and different ways of thinking about language learning and apply them in a very successful way into the curriculum when many times we have a standardized curriculum. One of the advantages to my position is since I direct a, a department, we are able to um, do many of these things collaboratively within the department and in a way where we can work 
integrated throughout many parts of our program, ranging from our classroom into our tutoring services. So that's a real bonus that we have in the program. So like uh, Van said, please feel free at any time to jump in and say anything you would like. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, first here about some of the, the opportunities we have. Of course, we're looking for interactivity, collaboration. Some of the things I've been playing with, and maybe you've heard me talk about this before, is different ways that we can look at augmented or immersive realities and help create a situated context for the language learning or the teacher training in language learning to occur, and um, improving them with motivation, and how gaming can be really similar to language learning in different ways. So I'm trying, and, and you know, the, the baby steps um, that I'm trying to use within my own teaching and then within our program are to think about ways that we can gamify our classroom activities, meaning we can expand our own ideas and pedagogies to take advantage of some of the opportunities that technology now affords. And so um, I like to kind of begin by very quickly thinking about how it is important the tech standards do outline many of the important ways that technology can be used for language learning um, and the creative uses that we can have in terms of communication conventions, also in terms of um, an article that I uh, wrote along with Greg Kessler about the ways that technology um, within the classroom can change as students' use of technology is changing and as technology is changing and there's more collaboration, we should re really be evolving with our pedagogical practice as well. Um, and then with student goals as well, we want, of course, our students to be autonomous, lifelong learners with creativity, and gaming has really provided an opportunity for us to, um, to explore some of these applications as well, time setting and things like that. So that students, and in our teacher training, I'm encouraging, I do a lot of teacher training in the program with our graduate students at Ohio University, encouraging them to look at ways that they can apply some of the gaming principles to the activities that they do in their classrooms now and then also in the future, making informed decisions and really taking us as a part of digital literacy is what we're looking for. So those are a lot of ideas to go through. Um, and what is a game? A voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles, okay? So if a game is voluntary, then the big question for me always is about a classroom situation, which oftentimes is not necessarily voluntary. A classroom activity is mandatory attempts to overcome unnecessary obstacles. So how can we as teachers help our students feel that they really want to engage and make it voluntary? is really um, part of the real motivation and the real essence of what we're trying to tap into in the program. So they feel that it is really something they want to do. And in many ways, language learning is like a game. For instance, um, we are trying in our program, and you know, I can feel, I'll be happy to give more explanation on some of these examples. Uh, feel free to chime in and ask if you would like. But we're really looking at how we can help students, especially with their writing, have very situated learning context. So that it's not just that they are doing uh, activities and writing papers that are not related, but that they're all in a situated context so that as students are sharing their work and as they are looking at their work together in class through Google Docs or something, they are able to start from the same context. They already know many things what they're trying to say and so they can evaluate and help each other um, because they share, share that context. They can help each other better think of ways to communicate clearly. So as Vance and I were talking about earlier, one of the ways we're doing that is through Minecraft with a freshman composition course for non-native speakers. Um, and then we're also looking at ways to help students think about problem solving and their own experiences. So for instance, if students need to be solving a problem, um, we create a space within Minecraft which is engaging and has a problem and then we ask them to do a number of readings on that and writings related to that and then they take that problem and they apply it to our local community and think of a, a way to apply a solution to that problem in our local community. So trying to pull everything together. Um, what is gaming that we're looking for? We're looking, you know, gaming is really a well-defined constraints with ill-defined solutions. So as I'm, for instance, doing my teacher training, I'm trying to suggest to my teachers that my pre-service teachers that they consider 
how, how can we create activities that don't always have just one right answer, right? But give them a certain amount of constraints so they don't feel that it's too wide open. Also ways that they can get some type of immediate feedback and try again, this is what games do. Increasing difficulty and the idea of emergence, which is that slowly different hints or clues emerge through time. Um, and strategy is really important as well, so that students feel that they're building a strategy. Um, here, this picture is intended to illustrate that a game like chess requires stat strategy. Many of the activities that we do in our classrooms, we might call a game, but in fact, they're just, there's a set path that students are going to need to follow when they make it to the end. Many people would say that's an activity and it's not really a game. And how can we change these activities into something that's more like a game? So I'll be giving some examples about that. Um, one digital game that um, I was involved with is the Trace Effects game from the Department of State. And that is um, probably many of you know, it's very popular internationally for young adults who are looking to learn English. And the game is, is not exactly, um, there are solutions to the game, so it doesn't exactly meet the criteria that I just described. But students are given a number of options to communicate in behalf of Trace. They assume basically the identity of Trace. And he is a character who has come from the future into the current time, and they try to get him back home to the future. So in the, the game, they have to move him around. They have to interact with people. They decide what he's going to say. They have to listen to what other people say to him. It includes a very interesting pragmatic component where um, students could choose uh, responses that are grammatically correct but rude. And then if they are rude to a character via trace, then the character is rude back to them or something like that. So it's an interesting way to get closer to reality for, um, for the users who are playing the game. So I wrote the teacher's manual for that. I was the lead author on that. And uh, as we were looking at this, we were thinking, what's the best way to help teachers integrate that game into the classroom? And that's what we find in my own experience as I am teaching, like I said, a direct -a program. And as we're trying to do this, we're always looking for ways that we can integrate the game into the classroom so students don't feel like it's just out there on its own. Um, so what I included in the manual was this graphic that students really bring with them curiosity and motivation to learn English, we're hoping, or we help them develop that. And then with teacher guidance is so essential for this game playing. Um, and the en engaging space is what the game is providing for us. And that can lead to then to the learning and the language use. And so teachers then can't just be telling students to go off on their own. I wouldn't encourage that ever with you know, any type of activity or with technology. But instead that students have that tied into the classroom. If they feel it's kind of some kind of separate add-on, they're not going to want to spend the time on it. They're going to feel like it's a waste of their time. Like, what, why are they doing this anyway? And so um, a lot of explanation really goes into helping students even sometimes realize that games can be a way to learn. We've discovered this with our courses, that sometimes when we, not just with games, but with other newer technologies, like we have a section, different section of our freshman composition course that has an iPad, an iBook. And some of the students there feel like real learning can't occur within the iPad because real learning is not that fun. So we have to really train students to accept the fact that they can learn and relax and have fun at the same time. And it's many times the same with these gaming environments as well. So ways you can take an existing activity and kind of twist it a little more into a game or take an existing game and twist it a little bit. I like to think about when I'm developing activities and uh, Jeff Kuhn has been really helpful with me to encourage me to think in these ways, is that you can kill a rule. So if you have a game and maybe get rid of one of the rules and see what that might do to the gameplay, if that can make the game more strategic, for example. Or you can take a resource and make it more limited or unlimited. Um, I like to play games with my kids a lot. They're 9 and 11 year old boys. And I like to watch the way they learn and what they respond to because kids that age are pretty good about being very honest about their engagement and what makes them want to try harder and try to succeed in the game. And there's a game called um, Settlers of Catan, and we, I don't know if anybody plays that. We like to play that as a family. And that's one where resources can become limited or unlimited and people have to work together within that game. 
And that's um, a great way to kind of start thinking about if you haven't done much um, thinking about doing more game type activities in your classroom, you might play some of these other types of games and just notice how these things work because a lot of them do these kinds of tips. Another one is changing the order of play, you know, just by simply doing that kind of thing. If you think even about UNO, um, UNO has cards which will switch things around for changing the order of play, so that happens in other games as well. Okay, so then I just thought I would, I don't know if there's any questions or comments. I have a couple sample types of activities before I go into those samples. Does anyone have anything they would like to say so far? I would just like to say that we encourage people to grab microphones and just raise a hand if you want to say something or something that occurs to you during the, the talk. And uh, I'll probably want to ask uh, Dawn later about her involvement with um, uh, trace effects and how they came to some design decisions and things like that. But for mm -hmm. right now, there's a hand up. Yes. Yeah, hi there. Thanks for the presentation Hi. so far there. Um, it, I just saw a reference to uh, standards from TESOL. That's the first I've heard of them. Is there any chance that you can put us onto that? I, I didn't realize that they had any sort of... Yeah, they do. Um, I, I always like to encourage people to look at them as possible. TESOL a few years ago put out the tech standards. Um, Phil Hubbard and Pageware and... Um, Sophie, I can't pronounce her last name, and Greg Kessler, um, Deb, Deborah Healy, um, I might be missing someone, were involved in that publication. So I don't know, Vance, can we put up a link to that? I believe part of the standards are available for a free download, and then some of them are, um, you would have to purchase through TESOL. Um, Vance, maybe we can find a link for that and stick that in there? Uh, if you'd like, I can Google. What should I Google? Yeah. TESOL standards for what? Um, technology standards. Yeah, TESOL technology, TESOL technology standards. Technology. You could, okay. Yeah, you could try putting Deborah Healy's name in. If you can't find okay. it, then when we're done, I'll Google around and see if I can find a I'll, link. I'll do but, that. In the yeah, they, okay, yeah. And then um, what they they have a list of um, skills that teachers as well as students should have for language learning and technology, and they also include um, some of the publications include vignettes to kind of outline how you might implement those standards with different levels of learners. So yeah, it's a good, useful publication. Great. Thanks for introducing it to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Oh, hello. Let's see. I have a question here from Halima. Um, yes. Is Mr. David Fay a creator of the tech standards, you mean? Yes. Or I'm not aware that... Mr. David Fay was the regional officer in Tashkent, Uzbekistan at the time, and mm -hmm. he demonstrated us his first clip of cartoons. And I even uh, recognized some cartoons being incorporated into this uh, gaming. Okay? Um, okay, yeah, I don't, I know Mr. David Fay. I'm not aware how much he was involved with the tech series. He may have written some of the vignettes. I'm not really sure about that. Uh, the thing is that many of our uh, colleagues from Uzbekistan are participating in shaping new ways of teaching English. You know this program in Adobe yeah. Connect. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. right. In Adobe um, Connect. But there are only passive participants. Maybe at our, uh, this, uh, in this room, it eliminates, we can create something about this new game in you, David, here, and I invite some people. If it's lasting results, will be like YouTube, if you agree. Um, also, repeat the same, le the same language, the same lesson in this room, and I invite my colleagues from Tashkent, from Uzbekistan. Mr. David C. knows many people personally because he worked here for five years. Yes, I am aware he was there. That's okay. All right. Well, that's an opportunity to explore. I see Vance has indicated the link there for the TESOL standards. So thank you, Vance, for putting that. I do, uh, it's, it's, I do inform our people at my Facebook page, and they will be very happy to meet you again in this room 
about this gaming, because nobody, only me, are participating in this uh, seminar. Okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I would. I'm always glad to. Yeah, share information and knowledge and ideas and work together. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Please, please don't forget to release the mic when you're through talking, so that others can take it. We have four available. Thanks. Um, were there other questions before I go ahead and go on to show a couple examples? I see someone here. Question. Okay. All right. So um, a couple of the ways that I have used. Um, with teacher training, how I myself have tried to apply the concept of gamifying activities into my teacher training. Um, the first one is to take the idea of a basic sentence jumble, so sentence jumble 2.0, and think of a way to expand that. So you might um, think uh, to yourself, how can you take a sentence jumble? Basically, if you were a basic sentence jumble, would be if you have separate words on pieces of paper, or maybe phrases on a piece of paper, and the students have to put them back in order. Okay, well, that's fine. That's a very useful activity. Um, but if you were to take some of these um, ways of thinking about activities and modify it a bit, you could take that sentence jumble and maybe create, have, find a type of sentence that would allow multiple correct um, and ways to put it together, and then some incorrect ways to put it together and allow technology to give students feedback on those. So that's the type of activity I created. I don't know if you're familiar with the app Erasma. It is an augmented reality app. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that um, app. But it takes, it's basically like a very fancy QR code reader. So you as the user, you can take it and you can, um, it's a free app to download. And you create it so that you can create any image or object to be a trigger, and once anyone who is subscribing to your channel puts their device over that trigger, they see um, a, an augmented reality, okay? So they see an overlay over the top of that. So it's not, of course, intended for education. It's intended for marketing. So uh, I think increasingly we'll see these types of things where there'll be a still image, let's say, and you can take your device, and have uh, Erasma up on that device, put it over the image, and then the image can come to life, for example, as a video. I don't know if anyone has um, seen that one, but it, um, it's a lot of, it, immediately it's motivating and fun. It's easy to use. It's not hard for anyone to use. In our building, we, uh, my students do generally have smartphones. It works on all types of platforms and devices and things. And we also have an iPad collection, so we can use it that way that you would need some kind of smart device. And um, so then what I did with that was, I, I think that hopefully gives you an idea of how that works. You can go to Erasma to see an example and things like that. But once you, um, what I did then is I had, I created an activity where we put together, I, I created a sentence that had these multiple ways to make it correct. And the students would have to hover over the sentence with Erasma. And then I had different things, so different auras for different sentences. So um, I'll show you the sentence here. It was one that I got from Terry Hike um, on Tech Teach Thought. And the sentence was, think of technology as a learning tool, not a teaching tool. It was just the first sentence. Think of technology as a learning tool, not a teaching tool. And you can take some of these things out. You could say, you know, possibly things like this here. Think of technology as a learning tool, not a teaching tool. Or you could say, think of technology as a teaching tool, not a learning tool, which is a very, it's a different meaning, right? Or think of teaching as a learning tool, not a technology tool. These would all be okay, but different meanings. So what I did with each one of those was, it, when you hovered Erasmus over, um, the students would see a different overlay. Um, and I created the overlay, some were pictures, some were videos, um, for instance, some of the ones like think of technology as a teaching tool, not a learning tool. I had a video of a former student say, oh, you know, that's really not really how I view it, and then go on to explain why they didn't particularly agree with that sentence. Um, and then the other ones were think of learning as a teaching tool, not a technology tool. Some of the ones that would be really kind of don't make sense. They would be grammatically correct, but they don't really make sense. Um, for those, I had overlays that indicated that they just really should think about that again. 
So the students in, enjoyed doing this and they could go around the room and try different sentences like this um, and things like that. Now there were, no game, there were no points or anything with this particular activity. It was just a way for us to begin to think about having multiple possible answers to something and really tying language to meaning. So that it wasn't just a fill in the blank grammatical activity, but that it was really tying meaning and what, what do you think? And they did it in pairs, so they had to discuss which answers they thought would be correct and such like that. Um, so that was one example. The next example is one uh, Treasure Hunt 2.0. And for this one, again, I used Erasma. This one was a little bit more complicated. Um, I put students, and these are my graduate students, into teams. And I tried to build some strategy into it and also the idea that there are no clear right answers and some levels of difficulty. What I did was I asked students to um, find an aura, and there were auras around the room, some were objects and some were pictures I had hung up, to find an aura. And when they found it, it would unlock um, an, an, a guideline. And I was, we were really, for our content for that day, we were talking about the power and the pedagogy of collaboration. So, the guideline would be something from some type of pedagogy of collaboration, which um, I had created and spoken about actually in India, where Claire was. And so um, they uh, would unlock, basically with the overlay, would unlock a guideline um, to applying this idea of how to collaborate together. And then what I wanted the students to do in their teams was to think of an activity that would exemplify that guideline. And then they had to create their own Erasmus overlay. So I taught them how to use the app how to create their own overlay for the guideline and then assign it to a new trigger in the room. So in this way they could create an overlay. Um, they had a couple choices and I gave them a couple ideas but I encouraged them to be flexible and creative with that. Um, some things some teams did, some teams created a video and they explained an activity that they would do. Some teams did a video of an actual kind of um, role play of an activity they would do. Some teams took pictures, just took a picture and demonstrating the activity they would do. Uh, some teams made a sketch on a piece of paper and took a picture of that. And then we had some, um, yeah, that's what, they, that's what they did. Those were the options they did. And then they had to assign that to a new trigger, okay? And then another, uh, there were two options with this. I hope that doesn't sound too um, complicated. So the other types of auras that they had was either a guideline for the pedagogy of collaboration or it was an actual activity. So they would find a picture of an actual activity in the room and then they had to create an overlay of what guideline they thought it was exemplifying. So what's the guideline? Why would you choose an activity like that? So through this, what I really wanted from the students was to critically think about how to use collaboration and technology um, and the way we, we engaged in that mental space and getting that discussion was through this game, which required them to think both ways. Not only what activities can we use to have really strong collaboration, but if we want to do a strong collaboration thing, you know, how, what kind of activities can we create? And then um, they got points. So I had anybody who created an activity for a guideline, they would get four points. If they created a guideline based on an activity, they got three points. If, and teams could steal each other's spots, basically, and then they could lose some points through that. And then the teams could go around with their own devices and see each other's, you have to subscribe to a channel, but they could see each other's guidelines and activities and videos and pictures that they created. Um, so they were able to then reflect on what their classmates did as well. So they were discussing things in their own groups and then they could reflect on what their classmates did as well. And at the end of the day, of course there was a winner, but um, there wasn't, you know, they, it was nice there was a winner, but the whole activity got such good discussion that everyone was really happy and the time in that class really flew by. Um, we really had a great time with that. Okay, what did they win? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I just had a little candy for them. It wasn't a big prize. <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't a real big prize, they got candy. Um, so those were the examples I had and I was really interested now, because we have a little time left. Sorry about that, I have two number ones in the slide, I didn't notice. When we could use these concepts or technologies, when you could in your own context, for instance, you know, when would you use them in your learning cycles? How can we prepare ourselves and, and our students and our teachers and training for the power that these games and these types of technologies have? So 
Does anyone have any? Um, I'm looking forward to all your suggestions and discussions for this. Uh, I'd like to ask the dumb question, which is the the on Erasmus. There was quite a lot of literacy in that. Uh, presentation <coughs> that <coughs> many of us may not have. <coughs> First of all, let's see, uh, you, you put some auras somewhere and triggers, and I just noticed from the chat that I, I think I'm, I'm probably in, people are probably going to appreciate my asking these questions. But um, that's really interesting. It would seem that we could maybe have another session on just that, you know, there's just a workshop on Erasmus. That would be very interesting. Could, could you maybe back up and explain a little bit um, to help us picture how, how, how does that work in your, your class? We, I mean, you went through it in a way we could go back and replay the recording and perhaps figure it out, but what, what else can you tell us to make, to clarify uh, what went on? Uh, what, first of all, it was is on pedagogy of collaboration. <clears throat> what was that? And then, what were you trying to get the students to do exactly to with the triggers and the auras? Okay, so yeah, I, it is a rather complicated example. I have found with these types of um, any time I speak on the topic of gaming and language learning, it's in my experience, and maybe it's just me pretty complicated and that's one of the challenges that I face in explaining it because as you are looking at activities that become incredibly context you know, rich, I mean the, the power of these activities lies within the fact that it draws so much from the context and the technology and it comes from the group you're working with so it does um, make it difficult. All of the, I always feel like the examples I discuss are very hard to explain whereas if you see them they aren't so complicated. Erasma is an easy app to use, so I'll kind of maybe go back and say a few things about from a user standpoint, not a pedagogic standpoint. So um, as a user, what you do is you download the app to your device, and then um, if you were simply not creating anything, but you just wanted to use it, you would have to find something that someone else created as a trigger. And um, so if you were a user, if you were a student in a class, and you knew something was a trigger, you just take your phone and you hold it around until you find the app will tell you, oh, I found a trigger and it will pull up a new image on your phone or your iPad, whatever it is that you have. So that's how it works. So from a teaching standpoint then, if you want to create that trigger, all you have to do is take a picture of what you want to be the trigger, tell her asthma, I want this to be a trigger, and then you t uh, have a picture or a video of what you want to be the overlay, and you tell her asthma, this is what I want to be the overlay, and you save that all together, you make that public on a channel, you create a channel for yourself, it, and then when other people join your channel, they will automatically see the overlay when they put the phone or the device over the trigger. So I hope that explains the app a little bit better. Um, once you understand how that works, it's just a matter of trying to create a game out of it, right? My goal was for my students to discuss these issues, and the pedagogy of collaboration uh, is a talk, um, um, in fact, I could find you the link for that too, for the paper um, that I wrote for that. But it has 10 guidelines on, um, and actually the talk it was at in the um, um, uh, India conference 2014, I'm blanking out on the name, Claire, what's the name of that conference? Um, it, was in, it was just in India in February, put on by the British Council, the Teacher Education Council uh, conference was uh, put on by the British Council in uh, India, in Hyderabad, in February. And so there's actually a link up there of my talk if you're interested in that, along with um, my publication from that. But what I wanted, the, what it suggests is that these are 10 guidelines for ways that we can think about um, basic collaborative guidelines for using technology for collaboration in our language learning classrooms. And I wanted my students to think about those guidelines. And so this was a vehicle, this game was a vehicle to get them to think about the guidelines from both ways. If you want to apply a, a guideline, what kind of activity might you make? And if you have an activity, don't just be doing activities with no thought behind it. So if you have an activity, what is the thinking behind it that would be a collaborative uh, guideline that you would apply? So that was my intention with that activity. I hope that helps. Does that help, thanks? 
sorry, looking for the mic button. Um, Don, I'll, I'll off list offline. I'll beg you to come back and explain that in greater detail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Were there um, other ways that people have thought of um, ways that you can use these kinds of concepts in your own teaching situations? Um, I can give another example that Jeff Kuhn, who you know, like I said, is a lecturer in my program, does great work with us. He has the idea that it seems like uh, the game of Jenga, um, which is where you have to pull the blocks out. You know, is there a way, for instance, to attach um, maybe with stickies or something words to the Jenga blocks, and students don't just have to pull out Jenga blocks, but they have to pull them out, like pull out the verbs or pull out the nouns or making a sentence or something, you know, like that. The way they pull their Jenga blocks out. So that would be an interesting because you would have strategy. You would have a certain amount of chance, and then you would have your language learning in there. So it's an interesting way of thinking of things that we already do or play, and how we can attach language learning to that. I will say it seems to be more complicated in my experience. The higher up with language learners you have, the higher proficiency. I think it's a little harder to um, apply some of these concepts. I think some of the things we're talking about, you know, uh, imagining a Jenga game. Jenga itself is quite fun to play. So, uh, and you have to have a strategy. And um, so, when you start uh, putting strategies and combining them with a learning task, uh, obviously things become very personal, and um, you know, people are compelled to play such games because you know there there is uh, there there confined. Uh, parameters, and also uh, you're trying to solve these difficult problems. You know, so as, as Jeff said in his one of his definitions, so um, that gets people to want to play the games, and then if you can uh, arrange them so that there, um, uh, you know, there are learning outcomes, that's that's really great. And uh, we've talked about how we can do that with Minecraft and this augmented reality. Uh, Erasma sounds very interesting. Certainly, I'm sure a lot of us here will be looking into that, seeing how that works, and um, and and the the Jenga idea. I'm wondering what what are you what are your impressions with trace effects? Is is that uh, something that people can really? Uh, you guys have a lot of uh, you know uh, materials built around it, um, and it's probably since it's the U.S. government. Given for free to people in my part of the world, I'm in the UAE. Um, you know, it's something we can take into our classrooms and use. But it's it's kind of in a way a different sort of game. It's more a game based. Would you agree that it's more game based learning than gamified? Um, yeah, uh -huh, I would agree. I mean, it's different, but I think there's room for all these types of things. You know, I think if you are Going to try to appeal to a very large audience with very a big variety of technology access to technology like Trace Effect is so it was created with a real understanding that not all users you know that it was created with an understanding that users would have limited access to technology in some cases so it couldn't be the latest and greatest and fanciest use of technology for that game. So when that, and also a variety of um, t learners from different countries and different contexts and things. So anytime you're appealing to such a broad group like that, you're going to approach the the game differently. Um, I think what makes it really unique. There are a lot of features that do make it unique, and um, some of them are like I mentioned that the user controls what Trace is going to say, and it includes that pragmatics um, in there as well. And so that's something that is really important. It does not include speech recognition or, you know, you don't speak. The learner never speaks. So that would be something, of course, in terms of technology that would require so much more. So it is more of a reading, listening um, type of activity. But then what we tried to do within the teacher's manual and all the many other activities that have been created for it are ways to help students, uh, teachers understand how they can take that experience of students learning within trace effects and then get prepare their students for that and then whatever language they hear and they kind of you know become more comfortable with within trace effects 
that they can pull that into their classrooms and do activities that further develop that. So that, I think, is really an important part of the game, is the huge emphasis on integrating the game into the classroom in ways that students can use that language even then in their own lives and in their communities and includes different ideas like volunteering in your community and things. So there are other cultural or kind of just good citizen things that are included in the, in the game as well. So I think that's a lot of the power behind it. Just sending someone to the game would have some impact. But in order to really make, I think, the most use out of it, it has to be really integrated into the classroom. Yeah, you guys have done a very good job uh, making materials to allow that integration to happen. Um, I'm looking at, well, thinking of one of Jeff's concepts, the possibility space, the idea of possibility space. Um, that seems to be very powerful. Whereas trace effects might have a limited possibility space, some of the other things that you're talking about, um, say, you know, having people use augmented reality to find triggers and things like that, the possibility spaces are quite expanded. I'm, I'm really interested in how that becomes a game. Well, I think, you know, Jeff talks about um, different types of games. So there's infinite and finite games, and something like trace effects has a definite goal. And so students have a couple different ways they can get at that goal. But by and large, there's one goal, and they pretty much know where they're going. They get points, um, or they can lose points according to how they use language. Um, and then things like Minecraft or using the Sarasma, it's more of an infinite space where you create the whole context. The technology allows you to create that virtual space and virtual context. And that really, you have to work, in my experience, extra hard within those as a teacher because you have to really create that narrative, that storyline, whether it's in Minecraft or using something like Erasma. Um, it could be with many different types of technologies. The question really is how can you create that drive and motivation and um, that, um, that idea that language learning is like a game. Those other kind of, let me go back to that slide, where you think about the, the ways risk taking and immediate feedback so all the different ways that, um, let me find that one, that learn, language learning is like a game. And the more you think about, here's the slide, the more you think about those kinds of things, then it gives you, in my experience, it gives me a way to think about using the, um, using the technology so that it's not just an add-on, but that you're really harnessing the real power of, that the technology offers. Yeah, Elizabeth? I hope that my mouth, my mic is okay now. Is that fine uh -huh. for you? Yeah. Um, yes. It was. I totally, totally agreed with you at the beginning. But uh, I mean, the English as a foreign language is being different to an English second language situation. For me, the whole um, and I teach university students. So for me, the whole lesson is a big game. We're kind of pretending to speak English. Um, mm. It was, um, I can't remember who spoke about uh, a good, you know, people who take a, a game like Monopoly, someone who's too involved in the game is really annoying, doesn't play well, and someone who doesn't give a, a damn about the game isn't good to play with either. So you get to this sort of middle situation where you all agree um, that this is a game you are playing. It's kind of like a postmodernist situation. Um, you know, postmodernism, as in the, uh, I mean, I hate postmodernism in the theatre when people come up and, uh, you know, break the frame with a, I, here I am playing this. But, I mean, to me, that's what postmodernism is. It's a looking at, it's kind of looking at the thing you're doing as a game. Does that make sense? Oh, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. I think um, it kind of relates to identity, you know, different discussions about identities and things like that, on how um, in performance-based um, education with language. I'm going to put this slide up here. Halima, you asked how to connect with me. This is my email, OK? Um, and also, uh, I guess I should put my Twitter feed on. I didn't put that. But you can just send me an email if anyone has any comments or questions or anything like that. You can send me an email. But I think you're right about 
um, the idea that it is a performance and it is a game. And I think tying into that power of games is what people are trying to do with this. And there's still so little research, and I think that's really the big struggle. Um, is it worth it? Because it, it is quite time intensive from a teacher standpoint in terms of trying to set this up to meet some real learning outcomes. So I think what we need is research on um, is it worth it basically. At Ohio University, Jeff and I are doing research from a student's perspective, just what are they experiencing? Um, what, is, what is their experience within this? We think that's a good place to begin because there is so little research when you have very advanced language learners, it's a freshman, like I mentioned, a freshman composition course with, um, within Minecraft for non-native speakers. So how do students respond within these places? And I think that's another important area for EFL contexts as well. How can this help motivate them and make them that drive, you know? Yeah, what, what, I, what I was um, uh, coming, hoping to find was how does you know, sort of more specifically, how does the language integrate into these games? Because um, in my game class, I'm very clear about the structures I want them to use, et cetera, et cetera. Has anyone done anything at the level of um, looking at the type of language? You know, can we find anything about the type of language which this, these kind of specific games give rise to? Well, in terms of my awareness, the thing is, like I mentioned, there isn't much research in, on actual outcomes for these kinds of things. But I think an important part to consider is when you use, I mean, one of the questions I was asking was, when do you use these kinds of things within your learning cycle? So, um, for instance, are you going to be doing a more traditional grammar lesson and then playing a game that requires your students to use that grammar in a meaningful way, and if they can't use that grammar in a meaningful way, they can't succeed at the game. So you can still incorporate, you know, have your definite ideas what you want for your language learning. Um, the, the tricky part is that it's very context specific and it really relies upon the teacher understanding what the, what the students are needing. What we're doing within Minecraft is we need our students to produce really uh, what we're looking for is we want our students to produce high-level critical thinking about their writing instead of just doing a type of freshman composition writing that is very generic, like um, you know uh, an argumentative paper about why um, capital punishment should be legal or illegal or something. These kinds of issues which are not really related to students' lives. So we're using Minecraft as a shared context, and from that, they're writing about like a phenomenon paper about their own experiences, their own um, experiences interacting with others within that space that was created for them and how limited resources and different things affect their own behavior and their colleagues or their classmates' behavior. So we're looking for a type of writing and then we are also looking for expected grammatical features that we will see for those kind of um, types of of papers that we would expect to see. So that's what we're looking for in our situation, but it does completely vary depending on each situation for these open games. Th thanks a lot. That's exactly what I was, uh, that makes a lot more sense now. Oh, okay. Yeah, one, one thing I'm getting from this, um, there, there's, you know, when you really uh, obviously trying to create games to engage learners. You really, the teacher has to be very much on top of um, the, the medium. And, uh, I, you know, with, with Minecraft, for example, teachers have to, I don't think it's going to work with, a, with teachers who are not really playing the game or they don't, they're, they're, they, could, they could set their students loose in it, but then on the other hand, that's going to maybe not reach the outcomes that they want, you know, whereas something with like trace effects can be designed in such a way that you can give it to any teacher uh, and that, that should work and they'll have fun in their classes enjoying playing the game and the students would benefit from that. Um, but I think the really interesting thing is where the, uh, as you're in a, a teacher training, in a teacher training program, you're trying to give teachers or trying to encourage teachers to take, to, to 
get on top of these games and you and find imaginative games that will really engage learners in very deep ways. Um, that's by the way, I'm keeping my eye on the time. Uh, we've been at this almost an hour now. I know you need to go, so maybe you could make a final comment and um, in your comment, you could say what you're going to do. Stay for another five minutes or go to the door. Sure. <laughs> no, okay. okay. Yeah, I think I've got another five minutes. No problem. Um, yeah, um, I think that's a really important part. Is that the reason I do this in my teacher training now is because I passionately believe there's a lot of power here, and it is certainly an area that needs to be fully, more fully explored in many different ways and researched. But if students, oops, sorry about that. If students themselves, if my teachers in training don't have the experience of learning through a game, because you know, if you think about digital natives and um, you know, um, generation 1.5, we really have teachers, let's say generation 1.5, when it comes to learning with gaming, because while a lot of the younger teachers now have experienced playing games and being very used to the internet and technology in general, they're not in my experience, they don't have experience actually doing much learning through games. So they have experience being consumers, but not thinking about technology as a real powerful learning tool through gaming. And in fact, maybe they even think that games are something that don't involve learning at all. And so my attempt really here is to get them to, to challenge those ideas and to let them see for themselves when they learn through um, a game type of activity like I'm creating for them, that they will then be more interested in trying to create those activities for their students. And then we have discussions. How can we do this in our own classrooms? I'm not going to be able to tell them how to create exactly the right game for every classroom they're going to have, but I can help them develop an appreciation for this way of, of learning and teaching and also some ways of thinking about it that can guide them as they make their future decisions. So that's my attempt with that. And as I've seen a couple um, different comments here, just that really is important to tie it always into reality. Um, and I think relating back to the EFL comment, the fact that you're in an EFL situation, games can provide a really great opportunity for the context of an English speaking context. If you're not surrounded by English, this is a place where it is really becomes an English speaking context. And there are so many more technologies coming now, like um, you've probably heard of the Oculus Rift. Um, which you look through these big goggles and then through that you can, the, the learner feels like they're completely inside a computer game. When you turn your head around, the whole room switches and you see a whole different room as if you were in a room. Um, as these things become more used and available and the costs come down, and as our young teachers become more accustomed to experiencing these things in their own lives, now is the time really to think about how we can harness those powers for, for learning so that they don't just decide that's something you do in your free time, but there's no learning potential. Um, so I, I guess my final thought is to encourage everyone to try uh, a couple little uh, baby steps um, and don't be too overwhelmed. If you're interested in the idea of how you could try to just think of activities in a more gamified way, and I don't mean that to be kitschy, but if you're interested in that idea, to so take just some little things that you can do in your class. Um, that's why I tried to provide some of these ideas to even just not always having a right answer and the ways that we can um, apply those concepts to existing things kind of slowly and then see how the learners respond. It, it does take a certain, obviously, amount of learner training. Even with my teachers in training, I provide quite a bit of other types of experiences before we launch into this kind of stuff. I let them get used to some other activities we do that are a little more, a little less traditional. So taking baby steps, seeing how it works, modify a little bit, try it again. Finding a, um, some kind of colleague who is also interested in it is very helpful so that you can talk some ideas through. I find that very helpful with this because it is a different way of thinking. So having some, maybe a sheet for yourself, you're going to try some different guidelines and how you can apply those to your own teaching and having a, a little group or a friend you can get together with and talk about those things and then share your successes or your frustrations with um, and not really giving up I think is an important part of that as well. Okay.
So I, um, I'd be happy to answer any final questions or Vance, it is 12 o'clock, what would you like? Okay, I was just posting a link to an article uh, just as a contribution to getting started on Minecraft. I've just uh, written one for Tesla EJ with uh, uh, Mariana Smolchitz yeah. and her son Philip. It's kind of an interesting take on Minecraft. Hello. And who's talking? We'll go ahead. It's a very good idea. Hello. Hello, what's up? I like the idea of Vance about EVO-Session as in Minecraft. Okay. EVO-Session, yes, EVO-Session yeah. for Minecraft. And, uh, only one question. Who can be motivator, trainer in this station, in EVO-Session? Vance, Well, uh, I think that we'll, my idea is we just get people together and try to learn it because that's the way it actually works. Um, it's not a top-down thing. You have to get people to, you have to get your students and people to learn the um, the tool and how to use the tool. So that's, um, you know, something that I, I hope I can try to help people learn it in the same way that the students would learn it and, and take whatever ideas we get from it and then apply them to our teaching. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Dawn very much, you know, for really spending our, her time with us. And um, uh, this is a, a session on gaming and gamification. And I think we, we really reached some uh, very deep issues in this, this topic. And we all have a lot to learn from each other. And Dawn has been someone who's been doing some very interesting work in this area, and especially with trace effects, a, a very uh, major contribution to that field. And um, and then also the research they're doing in Minecraft right now. I'm quite interested in that. But Don, I don't want to keep you. I know that, uh, like you said, it's noon. It must be lunchtime for you. It's dinner time for me. Uh, Elizabeth Ann mentioned food, as in food for thought. So our, as our minds start getting onto the rest of our days. Uh, I'd really like to thank you very much for coming along and providing us this food for thought. So thank you very much to Don Bukowski. Okay. Thank you, Vince and everyone. And please feel free if you have any ideas or anything uh, comes up, please send me a note there at Bukowski at Ohio.edu. And I look forward to furthering the conversation. I think it's going to be many years of ongoing discussion. Nice seeing you here, Claire. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, Vance, I'm going to exit, okay? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the way I generally do this is I uh, leave the mic on for any last comments, uh, but I do tell people that um, this, these sessions are recorded. They're being recorded right now. I'll switch the mic off shortly. And um, people need to leave the room in order for that recording to be made. So uh, people need to sign out. If you have any comments, go ahead. Anything, any last minute things you want to say, put on the recording. You're welcome to say that now. I'll leave that open for you. And wait a moment and then switch off the recording if everything gets silent. And the recordings are posted at learningtogether.net. And Ashley, uh, Ashil, Ashil Saglan, nice to see you from Istanbul. Uh, Ashil was a uh, presenter at the ITDI MOOC that's just ended. Any comments from you? And Perry, thank you, uh, from Hawaii, uh, long-time web head. And Halima, of course, welcome, uh, from Tashkent. OK, well, I'm going to go ahead and switch off the recording. And thank you very much for coming. And as I said, when once people leave the room, uh, I'll post the link to the recording, possibly in Twitter, um, put it up at learningtogether.pbworks.com right away, and uh, eventually put this uh, its link on, and, and probably it's embed, on, uh, uh, on learningtogether.net, which is our archive blog. Okay. Thanks very much. OK. This is. Yeah. Oh, you're still there. <laughs> I'm still here. I was okay. just going to say goodbye to you, Vance. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I hope it went okay. <laughs> All right. This is August 31st, 2014. I would like to put that in lots of places so people know.
can root themselves in time and space. And uh, we're just, I have to stay here till the very end. I'm, I'm the one who turns out the lights and puts the chairs up, up ended on the table. So I'm the last one to leave. Oh, it's just us. Yeah, it's just us. <laughs> okay, I was looking at, I was looking at the chat box. Okay, let me switch off the recording. Okay. If I can find the window for that. There's so many windows open. Here we go. Nope. Hello. Here we go.